So when I started making computers oh so many years ago, uh, I started with the concepts of how a computer works, which I had learned through a course in college called uh, Microcontrollers and Microprocessors. And there they taught us the very basic functions of a microcontroller and or computer uh, through the 8085. So I had a an idea of how these things work, but I didn't actually have an idea as to how it worked on a circuit level. And so when I started building these computers, uh, it was to try and explore how a computer might work on a circuit level. Uh, but that, of course, came with its own set of challenges. Of course, when you're building a computer, you're not only building the computer itself, but you're building the instruction set that it built or that it runs as well. So when I uh, when I first started making computers like these, I didn't really know how to make the computer execute uh, instructions with variable lengths. So what I did instead was I basically just made all instructions take the same amount of clock cycles and use the same parameters throughout the entire uh, instruction set. As a result, it ended up with an instruction uh, width of 16 bits and an instruction cycle time of five clock cycles, each clock cycle being about 20 ticks. Uh, and it was fairly straightforward the way it worked. I don't remember exactly how it worked because I didn't properly document it, uh, but there were five cycles and it basically went through and every instruction started with an op fetch and then from there it was basically a case of memory read, memory write, register access, and branch. Uh, and instructions would basically choose whether or not they would uh, execute that phase. And if it wasn't executed, it was basically just a wasted clock cycle. However, I didn't really like the wasted clock cycles that uh, Blue Wave was producing. So, as I moved on to the Skittlebits project, my mission was to try and eliminate dead clock cycles. And so with this project, I basically told the computer to execute something up on every clock cycle, no matter what. And that made for an interesting challenge. Uh, what I ended up doing was splitting the instruction into sort of micro-instructions, and those micro-instructions consisted of uh, four clock cycles, two of them being, or one of them being a memory address update, two of them being memory read, and one of them being memory write. Uh, and that helped a little bit. Uh, as a result, it was technically doing something on every single clock cycle, but it was doing it very, very slowly. Uh, it ended up taking about 12 clock cycles to do anything productive. Another issue that I was having was in order to achieve these uh, computers that squeezed power out of every single clock cycle, uh, it meant that I had more and more complex uh, control circuits. And so to try and make my control circuits a little bit neater, I incorporated the use of a state machine, which was something that I experimented on with the uh, Deep Thought project. And of course, after I felt comfortable enough with state machines being used as control circuits in a computer, uh, I started incorporating them in more complex and more powerful CPU models, with, of course, Skittlebits Rev2 being the first of its kind. Uh, I effectively was able to uh, reduce the number of clock cycles needed to execute a single microcode, and as a result, I was able to design more complex and more powerful instruction sets that were more closely packed together. Now, even though this computer model was able to perform the almost identical instructions to the original Skittle bits, but with far fewer clock cycles, uh, it still was a little bit wasteful because it took two clock cycles for every memory access, one to update the address and one to actually fetch the information. Now, Internal operations could be done in one clock cycle, but ideally I wanted to try and make internal operations and external operations uh, one clock cycle. The reason for this was because I actually had an idea for another computer model that never actually became a reality because I got sidetracked with a computer tutorial computer. Uh, it's probably one that I might never actually uh, see become a reality just because we're actually taking computers in a different direction here. Uh, but effectively what I wanted to do uh, was set it up so that uh, instructions that required an internal operation would actually be executed uh, whilst it was performing an external operation uh, that is an op fetch for the next instruction. 
so effectively it would have been like a two-stage pipeline where uh, anytime an instruction wanted to perform something with the ALU, it would separate the ALU and the registers from the uh, program counter and instruction register and memory and then perform the opt fetch for the next instruction. Uh, what this would effectively accomplish would be uh, a computer that would fetch something or send something to memory on every single clock cycle. Now we are seeing a little bit of that in the Stackish interpreter or FATStacks model here uh, where we actually have memory being accessed once per clock cycle. Uh, however, we don't have an opportunity to actually perform internal operations in parallel because uh, everything is sort of integral. Uh, there aren't any phases in the instructions where uh, the hardware can be separated per se. Now that's not to say that this theoretical computer might not become a reality at all. I do intend on making one more of these state-based computers uh, before I move on to something that people have been suggesting uh, and even requesting, and that is uh, pipeline computers. Now that's something that I've, it's caught my attention and I definitely want to try it out. But like I said, I want to try and just experiment with one more state-based machine uh, before moving on. Uh, but that does bring up an issue that I wanted to kind of address between all of these computers. The issue primarily sits in the design phase of these computers. Uh, when actually designing these things, uh, maybe about 20% of the work actually goes into the hardware and the other 80% goes into the actual instruction set and usually the way I design these things is I start with the instruction set and build the hardware around it uh, usually only making changes to the instruction set where I see it might be too difficult to do something in hardware so as a result I was actually thinking it might be beneficial to actually create sort of an official instruction set uh, of my own making to actually use on uh, computers from this point on. The advantage of this, of course, means that I could save time in the development process uh, because I don't have to develop a new instruction set for each computer each and every time, but it also means that I actually have something that's backwards compatible, which means if I actually write uh, software for newer models, I could still run it on old models. This might be useful for bench testing. Uh, not really necessary, though. but six of the requirements that I want to have for my instruction set is that it is space efficient and time efficient and what I mean by that is uh, a lot of my instruction sets often have blank spaces uh, if you read the documentation you'll actually see an X in those locations meaning it doesn't matter what the bits are it doesn't make any difference I don't want to see that in my instruction set I want to see every bit of the instruction uh, code being used and I also want it to be time efficient as I said, with the uh, most latest model and the model that I'm probably never going to get to, uh, I wanted to have the uh, memory bus being occupied on every single clock cycle. So I want uh, I want something similar with this instruction set where uh, everything is busy at every single point of the time, regardless of whether it's a pipeline or a state-based machine. Uh, I want it to be flexible but powerful. So that means I need to have extremely versatile uh, instructions while still maintaining uh, instructions such as stack manipulation uh, and such. And then I also want it to be expandable. Uh, that's important because I don't know what I'm going to be adding in the future. So I want to have room for future instructions. Uh, but I also want it to be executable on both a pipeline or state-based machine. So that's quite a few requirements for an instruction set and not one that I feel a whole lot of currently existing instruction sets have met. So one possible solution would be something like this. Now I know this kind of looks like a mess, but uh, this is basically what, instru <laughs> what instruction sets look like when they're being developed. Uh, I usually do it in a spreadsheet, but for the sake of the video I figured I'd have a physical model for you. Uh, and the idea behind this was for a future computer that I'm planning on doing here soon. Uh, possibly after the fat stacks project but um, it basically consists of I guess what you would call eight instructions uh, even though they're not actually instructions this technically counts as a move mode uh, so this is all move oriented uh, and that allows me to get the most uh, out of a the fewest amount of instructions possible uh, but we have move register to register move register to memory based off of a register 
move register to memory based off of register plus an immediate. Uh, we have alt instructions. Uh, we have uh, move register to stack pointer. We have move register to immediate. Uh, move register to memory based off of immediate and move register to IO uh, based off of immediate. So really what I'd like to see is the each of these colors kind of represents groups of bits. Uh, if it's grayed out it means it's no longer needed in that instruction. Uh, ideally I would like to see these all kind of vertical columns which you can clearly see uh, the immediate value isn't used in all of the instructions. In fact it's only used in about half. Um, the register B value is only used in about three instructions. Uh, after that it is fixed as the stack pointer uh, and uh, for another three instructions it's also fixed as the stack pointer but not actually used. Um, things like the destination bit that's not used a couple times. Number of operands that's not used quite a few times. Um, and then these alt instructions was intended to be the expansion instructions, so things like push, pop, jump, call, return, those would all go in there. But we've got 20 bits to fill and about 10 instructions to fill it with, so it's not likely that we're going to be using all of these bits, uh, which is why I kind of blank them out. It's a very good chance that a good chunk of these bits will be kind of blank for those instructions. So the idea behind this was kind of x86 based, uh, where we would always choose, or for the most part always choose, uh, two registers, A and B. Uh, and depending on the number of operands, if it was uh, one or two, or excuse, yeah, one or two, um, basically data would either flow from A uh, from B to A, uh, or it would be an operation between A and B flowing into A. Uh, and that operation is determined by the function and the uh, number of operands. So those two kind of work in conjunction. So if it's a, if number of operands is zero, B is operated to move it, moved into A. If it's a one, A and B are operated together and moved into A. And then the destination bit actually changes what the, what the destination is. So if it's a zero, it's A. If it's a one, it's B. And so that's basically sort of, not quite with the functions part, but that's basically the way x86 kind of arranges their instructions. Uh, and it's pretty damn useful. Uh, the sheer fact that it's been around for about 30, 40 years now uh, should be evident enough of how useful it is. But then we also have a bit for latching flags. Uh, obviously when we're moving data through from register to register is passing through the ALU, hence why we always need to provide a function. Uh, so there is always the option to compare two registers together and for that we would need to latch the flag. So we have that bit to determine when that actually happens. Uh, and then of course the immediate column is there for immediate values whenever the instruction needs it. And so how those registers, functions, and immediate values all kind of work together is determined by these two bits, uh, which again uh, basically just does these. So a move R to R will move the contents from one register to another. Uh, and of course all of these rules still apply so we can Assuming all of these are zero, we can move from B to A. Uh, we can also move, if we turn the number of operands on, uh, an operation between A and B to A. If we switch the destination to on, we can move an operation between uh, A and B to B. Or if we just turn destination on and leave number of operands off, we can perform a move between A to B. Uh, now that does mean that there are duplicate and redundant instructions, but that's totally acceptable. The same thing applies with move RM to R, uh, which basically does the same thing except the B register is replaced with memory based on the B register. So you would select your B register, uh, and instead of actually getting the content of the B register, you would get the content of memory uh, where the B register points. The same thing with RM, R plus I. It's the B register plus an immediate. Uh, and then up here is where things get a little tricky. So the idea with these instructions, and again, this is based heavily on the x86 instruction set, is that these instructions are all based on the prerequisite that B does not equal the stack pointer, which I've arbitrarily decided is equal to 110. Uh, so, so, so long as register B does not equal that sequence, uh, these instructions will be executed. However, if it does equal that sequence, these instructions are executed.
And so with these instructions, they, for the most part, work the same way. We can basically perform a move operation between a register and the stack pointer. So this can be useful for things like moving into the stack pointer or uh, performing arithmetic on the stack pointer and a register. Uh, we can move from uh, a register to, or sorry, from an immediate to a register, which is basically a load immediate. Uh, now for that, the stack pointer isn't actually used, which is why they're grayed out. Uh, however, they're grayed out with, you know, the two tones to actually represent which bits are one and which bits are zero, because it has, is actually required that these are uh, pointing to the stack pointer. So this moves data immediately from the immediate to the register. It is a one way for that reason. The destination bit is blocked out. We also have move from register to memory base solely on the immediate, whereas before we had a register plus an immediate, this would be more like a load and store instruction. Uh, and then a similar thing just with the I.O. So as far as time efficiency is concerned, I feel this would work fairly well. I also feel it would work fairly well on either a pipeline or a staged computer uh, or a state-based computer. Um, so those, I feel, it pass. However, save, uh, space efficiency, I don't think it does too terribly well. As you can see, there are a lot of bits that aren't used. Uh, flexibility, uh, because we have the uh, alt instructions uh, area there, that does mean that there's a flexibility and expandability. Because it's x86 derived, I feel it's also fairly powerful. Um, but that's just the big thing right there, is just all those missing bits is not something that I'm a fan of. Another instruction set that I designed to try and tackle this challenge was uh, this one right here. Now, you'll notice it's quite a bit smaller, but it's also quite a bit longer. Um, we'll get to that in a sec. It works basically the same way as the first. For the most part, we have latch flags, we have a destination, we have a number of operands function, register A, register B, and immediate. Uh, we also have this bit right here, which is a memory access, and a condition set of bits. Now, this is, for the most part, I guess, also x86 derived, but it also actually uh, inherits some attributes of the ARM instruction set, uh, which, if anybody has a smartphone, which should be pretty much everyone, uh, ARM is the type of instruction set and uh, microcontrollers that are usually found in smartphones. So those were designed to be very, very lean, very low power, and very uniform. So I kind of borrowed attributes of, of that to incorporate into this. So the way this works is, again, similar to the last one, uh, except anytime we have a move operation, the immediate is always taken into account. So if we're performing a move from register to register, it doesn't matter if it's a one operand or a two operand, uh, the equation is always going to be uh, the destination is equal to the source plus the immediate. Unless, of course, it's a two operand equation, then the destination is equal to the source plus the destination plus the immediate or operate between the registers. You get the idea. And then, of course, with a memory access bit being equal to one, uh, now the immediate is being used for an immediate offset to memory. So memory will always be addressed with a register and an immediate. And then lastly, the condition determines whether or not the instruction actually executes or skips, which uh, is a little bit unconventional compared to what I usually do. Uh, but it actually makes quite a bit of sense to do it this way. Uh, it also makes it easier to skip entire blocks of code uh, when you're uh, looking for a particular condition to be met. So why do I feel this is acceptable, but this isn't? Uh, the reason for that is if you actually look at some of the statistics when it comes to programming, uh, especially in machine language, uh, in just about any instruction set, uh, mostly in the x86, but for the, a good majority of them, uh, when it comes to actual machine code uh, instruction frequencies, the number one most used instruction is a move instruction, and it takes up about 35% of all code. So it makes sense to make your move instruction as powerful as possible. Uh, with this, this is my only move instruction. The other is the reserve instruction, uh, which is for other instructions. So with this, I feel this doesn't quite, you know, meet the cut because we have effectively seven move instructions and only one other instruction instructions, uh, and not all of those move instructions use all of the um, use all of the parameters. So 
if 35% of my code is going to be these, I'd want these to be fairly easy to program. So I don't feel that that really is easy to do, whereas this, this is fairly straightforward. However, this also does have its share of issues. Uh, for one, we don't actually have any stack uh, operations or anything like that. Those would have to be performed in the expansion, which is fine. We can do that. But we also have 24 bits to fill versus the last one, which only had 20. Uh, so that means that we're going to have a lot of blank bits there as well. Again, considering that 35% of the code is going to consist of this, I don't feel that that's too big of an issue, but still it's not something that's ideal. Now obviously with an instruction like this, where all the bits are being used and it's basically just one long wide instruction, uh, is we're bordering eerily close to old-fashioned Minecraft computers such as, you know, the ones that Swift X16 have made popular, uh, where we basically have lines of program memory. Uh, the only thing I feel different uh, differentiates between this and those style of computers is this expansion. Obviously, if we're going to be using expansion instructions, they're not going to fall under this formula or this format, uh, and so we will have to do some special uh, operations in order to accommodate such instructions. So, pipeline computer and you know, stage computer or state-based computers alike are going to have to have some special circuitry to accommodate these instructions. Uh, but that's basically just a thought experiment. Uh, obviously, this isn't finalized. I'm not even taking this seriously. This is all just, you know, just kind of messing around with ideas here. Um, but what I want to know is what you guys think. Uh, what do you think could possibly be improved? Do you think maybe this instruction is too long or too powerful or too complicated? Uh, and also, if you guys have any suggestions of your own, if you guys have any ideas for instruction sets that maybe uh, you think would be a, a viable option for me to use from here on out. Um, otherwise, if, you know, if we don't come up with anything, whatever. That means I just go back to designing custom instruction sets per computer. But I figured, you know, it might be worth it to try and invest some time up front designing one that I'd be happy with using from here on out. So if you guys have any thoughts, I would love to hear it in the comments. Uh, otherwise, I will see you guys in the next video. Bye.